your timetable thing on the table, you'll see that um, uh, Miss Silke Wagner should be your next speaker. She sadly can't be with us today. Very short notice. She really wishes she could have been, but she can't. So we're going straight on to Simon. Good, good morning. Um, my name's Simon Blackburn. I'm a consultant paediatric surgeon at Great Ormond Street Hospital. It's a real privilege to be here with you this morning. Um, I know I speak for all of my colleagues who are here um, when I say that it's a real privilege for us to look after your children. Um, I've got an interest in colorectal surgery. I work as part of a team of people at Great Ormond Street looking after girls with cloacal anomalies. Um, and part of that experience for me has been working in a multidisciplinary team of professionals, including specialist nurses and my colleagues from the psychology team. Um, and I think one of the, the great learning points for me as part of that has been to pick up on some of what Greg was saying earlier on about the holistic view of the way in which anorectal anomalies can affect a child and family in toto and in different ways at different points in life. But I'm not going to talk about that this morning. What I'm here to talk about this morning is boys with anorectal anomalies. <laughs> and I am going to focus quite specifically on the anorectal anomaly, whilst acknowledging, as I already have, that this is something that happens to a child in a context, sometimes, as Professor de Coppi was saying, to a child who has other medical problems alongside that. And what I'm going to try and get over to you today is that the outcome in terms of continence, particularly faecal continence for boys with an anorectal anomaly, is really all about the anatomy and all about the position of the fistula. What we mean by the fistula is the point where the rectum opens somewhere else where it shouldn't be. Sometimes that's on the perineum, which is the area between the legs, and sometimes, most commonly in boys, that's into the urinary tract. Very occasionally in boys, and particularly in boys with trisomy, trisomy 21 or Down syndrome, the fist, there is no fistula at all. And I'll show you an example of that. So this is a more straightforward anorectal anomaly in a boy. This is a view of the bottom in a newborn, and you can see there isn't an anus. But there is meconium just under the skin, which is tracking up in the middle, up towards the scrotum. And this is a boy who's got a perineal fistula. What I mean by that is that the rectum is opening onto the perineum, the bit between the legs. And you can see that the anus is really, the, the rectum is really very near the skin indeed. And this is a situation in which it's possible to do a single stage operation, to do a simple anaplasty, to put the anus into the right position on the perineum and get the baby spontaneously evacuating through their bottom. More commonly in boys, we're faced with this situation and it's very, very difficult to know what on earth is going on except that there isn't a bottom. Occasionally, you, in newborns in this situation, you'll find bits of meconium coming out through the penis, through the urethra, and that tells you that there is a fistula somewhere between the rectum and the urinary tract, but it's impossible for anybody to know where the fistula is based on these clinical appearances. And of course, what we would do in this situation is manage the baby with a colostomy, um, and Professor de Coppi's already talked to you about that. The next thing we would do is one of these. So I'm sure many of you will remember this test, um, but this is what's um, somewhat confusingly called a micturating cystourethrogram and a distal colostogram. Um, and to unpack that, what that means is that we do a test in x-ray where the x-ray doctors will put a catheter into the bladder and fill the bladder with dye and then get the baby to wee and take some pictures while they're doing it. And with, on this study you can see also that some dye has been put into the distal or downstream stoma so the bit at the back, which is on the right of the picture if you look at it, so this is a picture of a baby from in the middle, as if they've been sliced in the middle, down the middle. Um, and you can see that the rectum is at the back and the bladder is at the front. And those of you who are at the front of the room, and hopefully some of you at the back of the room, will be able to appreciate that there's a tiny little connection between the two. And that's the fistula. 
So this is a baby who has an anorectal anomaly with a rectourethral fistula. And it's really important for us to get a really good study from our radiology colleagues before we operate on these babies because it allows us to work out what we're likely to run into during surgery at what point. So just to reiterate, this is the commonest anomaly we see in boys. This is a rectourethral fistula. You can sometimes see them higher up the urethra and also we see fistulas that open into the bladder neck. And this is an example of what I was talking about before. This is the same um, snappily titled micturating cystourethrogamma distal colostogram that I was talking about before. But you can see on this image that there is no fistula. And this is a patient of mine who has trisomy 21, who, in whom when we went to repair the anorectal anomaly, we didn't find a fistula at all. But that is an unusual situation. So, as Paolo was just saying, the, the way we would approach these lower anomalies where the rectum is opening into the urethra is to do an operation from the bottom, um, a so-called PSAR, and we would do a procedure where we would open the muscles in the midline, find the fistula, detach the rectum from it, close the urethra at the back, and then place the rectum in the sphincter. In this situation, where there's a fistula into the bladder neck, it's impossible to get to that fistula from the bottom, so a procedure is needed to detach the rectum from the bladder at the top. And that, more commonly these days, is done using keyhole surgery, but can be done using an open operation. So, why am I going on about where the fistula is? Well, one of the reasons I'm going on about where the fistula is is because it's important technically to know where it is. And the other thing is that the outcomes of boys with anorectal anomalies are determined to a large degree by where the, in the urinary tract the fistula opens. These are figures from um, Risto Rintala's group in Helsinki. And Risto and Tyler's group in Finland have done an awful lot of long-term studies on lots of things in paediatric surgery, and anorectal anomalies is certainly one of them. So this is from a paper by Christina Kirkland, and this is a study that looked at continent outcomes in boys over a reasonably long period, 4 to 29 years, who have anorectal anomalies with a rectourethral fistula. VBMs, it's like a whole alphabet soup are voluntary bowel motions. This, the next column is the percentage of boys who've got voluntary bowel motions and total continence. And then the third column is a medium bladder function score where 20 is the best. Um, and in the right hand column you can see the percentage of patients who are using an ACE to help with their continence. And you can see that the outcomes for boys who have a fistula that's lower down the urethra in terms of their continent are better. So for example, 92% of the patients in this study with a bulb urethral fistula had voluntary bowel motions and 42% had total continence. And if you look at boys with a bladder neck fistula, the rate of voluntary bowel motions is down to 25% and total continence is nothing. And similarly, you can see that the number of boys who are dependent on an ACE for bowel management goes up significantly depending on where the fistula is. And just to make the same point twice, this is, these are data from Alberto Peña's group. This was published back in 2005, but it's still a really good study, which essentially say, shows the same thing, that your percentage chance of having voluntary bowel motions and achieving total continence is much lower if the fistula is higher up the urethra. The other thing that makes a difference is how old you are. So as boys get older, the percentage of them who have soiling and fecal accidents goes down significantly. And there seems to be a movement at around the age of 12 to 13 when boys are going through puberty where things get significantly better. Now, it's possible for these kinds of figures to cause utter depression both in the surgeons and the patients and their parents. But I think it's really important to recognise that continence in this context is about the, just the ability to spontaneously open one's bowels on the toilet and stay clean in between. 
and social continent, which would be all of our aim for all of our patients, is something a bit different, which is giving the child and then the young person and the family a way of controlling pooing, which means that they can evacuate when the, at a time and place in their choosing and stay clean in between. So what we're talking about when we look at these figures is, in inverted commas, normal continents, where the child or young person is able to feel the need to go, then goes and stays clean in between going. And there are lots more talks along those lines coming later. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much for your attention. There's something about the severity of the anomaly being reflected in the, the level of the fistula. So it's it's not just the fact that the rectum is further away from the pelvic floor, but it's also the fact that in boys with a bladder neck fistula, you t one tends to find that the muscle structures of the pelvic floor are less well developed. So it's although we tend to think of it in terms of where the rectum opens, because it's a way of classifying things into some kind of recognisable groups, accepting that everybody actually is an individual person. The severity of the anomaly in terms of the area around where the anus would normally be tends to be greater the higher up the opening is, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Is the nervous system significant association between spinal problems, particularly lower spinal problems and, and issues with the sacrum and anorectal anomalies. And it's certainly the case that in children who have a, high, a fistula that opens higher up, the risk of a problem with the sacrum and the nerve supply to the pelvic floor is higher. So, and you, it's in, almost impossible to separate those two things out. So what one is often dealing with is a situation where the nerve supply to the pelvic floor is not normal and the anatomy of the pelvic floor is not normal and in that individual person it's really difficult to separate which of those two issues is the major contributor. Is there any sort of therapy to help develop the muscles at any stage? Not, not that's in routine <coughs> clinical use at the moment, there's, there's some research stuff coming your way later on um, but certainly I mean one of the things is growth, and of course muscles get a lot bigger and stronger as children go through adolescence. So one of the explanations for the improvement one sees in um, boys with anorectal anomalies, and in fact girls with anorectal anomalies, during puberty is that actually the muscle structures of the pelvic floor are better developed and therefore have a greater degree of an ability to control continents. One more question, and then we'll be having a short break. Take this question. Um, someone with with tethered spinal cord and has um, and the IA together. Mm -hmm. Once they had the tight spinal cord detethered, how does that affect the um, the nerves to the bowel and the the opening? Yeah, that's. I th I think one of. The best answer to that question is, is it's really not clear. There are certainly children who have a tethered cord and an anorectal anomaly. Those two things coexist. And in some children, they get very clear symptoms from their tethered cord. Largely, some, so one of the things you can get is lower limb pain. Another thing is difficulties with continence. Um, and often those symptoms in symptomatic children will respond to the cord being untethered. Whether untethering a tethered cord in a child who doesn't have symptoms that you can directly relate to the cord's tethering actually then leads to an improvement in continence later on is, I don't think anybody actually knows that. Um, and certainly the, the conversations we have with our neurosurgeons about this would suggest that their feeling is that routinely untethering cords in children who are not getting symptoms is probably not the right thing to do. But it's very much a case-by-case -case individual judgment. And it's tough because you, you've got 
a child who's got a, a tethered cord which may lead to some difficulties with continence coexisting alongside a condition that is clearly going to affect their continence in other ways and it, it, it's tough to know what the contributor is to that um, so it's, it's actually a really difficult question to answer A short 15 minute break now, so we'll stop the questions out in the uh, before you ask before. Can we please ask you to be back for um, half past 11 because we really want to stick to our timings today? Um, any other questions you come up with, please make a note because at the end of the medical session, there is a QA and discussion panel there. Thank you very much.